Hello programmers, my name is Ethan and I'm a full-stack JavaScript developer. Currently, I work as a freelancer in a group of freelancers called The Guild. And in my free time, since I love programming, I try to contribute as much as possible to the open source community and specifically into open source media projects. For example, one of my recent projects involves the combination of React Native with Meteor, which is a pretty interesting subject, but not for now, for another talk. Anyways, I chose Meteor as my default solution for building JavaScript applications. I know other people and companies did so too. So today I'm going to talk about Meteor and explain exactly what makes it outstand as a platform, because when you think about it, it really brought new stuff to the table. So I planned this lecture in such a way that those who aren't familiar, familiar with Meteor and haven't heard about it will now have a clue about Meteor, what it is, and at least the basics usage of its API. And those who are familiar with it and maybe already using it for you, I will talk about the changelog of the two recent versions of Meteor, which are currently Meteor 1.4 and 1.5. So hopefully at the end of the day, everyone's going to be all happy and satisfied. I will try to talk as much as possible about Meteor in 50 minutes. So let's begin now. What's even Meteor? So Meteor is a platform for building JavaScript applications both for the mobile devices and web browsers. Now, you don't have to be the most genius programmer out there in order to use the platform, but rather the most average one and still build great applications in great times. So before Meteor, what to quicks can now take up to several hours. Of course, it depends on the size of the application or the project, but the point is that development with Meteor is pretty fast until you reach a point of production, which is one of the main reasons why companies like the ones presented here, chose Meteor as their solution as well. I would like now to go quickly through the key features of Meteor's API in a very high level. I will only give you the bigger picture, and after, I will dive into each of these sections in a bit more details. So, the first thing you should know about Meteor's API is that it exposes nothing but JavaScript. It means that when you use Meteor, you write for the client, server, and the database itself using JavaScript only. No Ruby code, no Python code, any other any other language whatsoever, something which is very natural and you would expect. Once you write a JavaScript application, you would like the platform to also be 100% JavaScript as well. Also, if you look at the rest of the list, you'll see that Meteor really breaks lots of conventions and stuff which were pretty common up until now. For example, Meteor applications don't encourage the usage of REST API. Instead, if you would like to fetch data, you would have to use publications and subscriptions now, if you are familiar with it, it's a bonus, and if not, very soon I'm going to go through it. Also, Meteor helps you build single web page applications, meaning that once you use these applications, which were built using Meteor, you don't have to even hit the refresh button. Instead, the transitions between the pages are going to be as smooth as possible. Also, Meteor provides you with a feature called Live Reloading, meaning that as soon as you implement a new feature in your application, the application is going to refresh by itself, resulting in this feature available to you instantaneously. Meteor comes with its own built-in bundling system, the same style as Webpack and System.js, only it has zero configuration and you can start coding the latest JavaScript syntax of ES2015 right out of the box. Meteor combines front-end and back-end, meaning that it feels more like a single unit. Uh, there's no such separation anymore to the point that sometimes you would have to write a single module which would be loaded on both, thanks to Meteor's awesome bundling system. The client can also access the database directly, which is not trivial at all, considering that so far it was a privilege to the server and the database itself only. Of course, under certain restrictions, because you don't want the client to access whatever data he wants, because the client is always untrusted. And also, Meteor provides you with reactive programming abilities. If, you're not, if you aren't familiar with reactivity, it's something pretty awesome. It's hard for me to tell what it is in a very high level, but I have dedicated slideshows just for it, so you shouldn't be worried. So you got the idea. Meteor is awesome, yeah. But when you look at the NPM Packages repository, it's full of packages which are so-called awesome, and I say that in quotes. So why would you even consider approaching Meteor? Well, I would like to approach such a question by first telling you, uh, giving you a brief history about JavaScript, how it all started, and from, from there I'm going to talk about Meteor's agenda, and maybe, maybe hopefully, it, it will help you decide. 
So when Netscape first developed JavaScript, they developed a dynamic scripting language, which was designed to make very simple HTML manipulations, which ran on the browsers back then. Again, it was, it was very simple, very slow, very basic, nothing special. You could say it was even lame. With that said, big wealthy companies like Google, Microsoft, and Mozilla saw the potential of the browser, and so they started hiring all the best engineers from all over the world, targeting one mission, developing the best JavaScript out there with the best runtimes so they can have the best browsers, and all the traffic would go for themselves. So they started their own branch of the JavaScript engine plus minus at the same time, and because of that, uh, a fight started between them, and you can say there's... Uh, you can call it a browser's war, and this war kept going on and on and until this very day, and as I speak, in fact, it's still very active. So because these are big companies, and whatever they do, everyone joins them. Also, individual people in smaller companies saw the potential of the browsers, and so they started using the engine to develop client applications. The community grew bigger, and as you probably assume, the scale of the community is actually a function of the runtimes. So the, gr the greater the community is going to be, then the lower the runtimes are going to be. And JavaScript became really fast. In fact, in fact, it's the fastest dynamic scripting language out there. Faster than PHP, faster than Python, faster than MATLAB, anything you could think of. And so client applications worked pretty great for the browsers. And so people thought for themselves, hey, if it works that great for the client, why not use it to also build server applications? So I believe this is one of the main reasons why they even created Node.js and so people started using the Node.js platform to also uh, create server applications. And JavaScript became full stack. And when you think about it, it's like some sort of a snowball. We troll down the hill and with time it gained mass and became massive. And be ev before we even knew about it, JavaScript really took over the world. You can find it on all the web browsers and every mobile device out there. And it took over the world. So because things have happened so rapidly, no one ever sat still and thought of the ultimate JavaScript, ultimate platform for the JavaScript language. I will give you an example. When I say C Sharp, the language by Microsoft, what do you think of? You think of the .NET platform, right? .NET is the optimal platform for the C Sharp language. Now, from my own experience, C Sharp nowadays is not as popular, popular as JavaScript but it is a great framework. It provides you with all these neat features like WCF, WPF, whatever you could think of, and whatever happens to C-sharp and whatever uh, update they release to C-sharp, Microsoft got you covered. So they will also update their platform as well. So you never get to be worried. In, media, in the media company, they wanted to achieve exactly that, re that effect. So whatever happens to JavaScript, Meteor got you covered. So, for example, if you created a Meteor application about two or two and a half years ago, because Meteor exists for quite a time now, uh, and you used the old syntax of JavaScript of ES5, uh, now actually you get to use, uh, you can slowly migrate into the new uh, syntax of ES2015. Um, yeah, so again, like Microsoft, Meteor got you covered, they got your back and you can rely on them. There's a big company uh, lying behind this uh, platform, and that's why you should choose Meteor over any other uh, platform or framework. So I talked about the key features of Meteor's API. I gave you a brief history about JavaScript, how it all started, about Meteor, which was pretty nice. And now I would like to talk about the fundamentals of Meteor's API. And as I promised, I'm going to dive into each of the sections that I just presented in the key features. So uh, I don't know if you remember, but the second thing I mentioned when I went through the key features of Meteor's API is that Meteor applications don't encourage the usage of REST API. So if up until now we're used to send requests with certain parameters into a specific path and receive a response with data, now instead you would have to use subscriptions and uh, publications in case you would like to fetch data. Okay, so for example, if you have a data set of messages, so these messages should have a belonging publication defined on the server. So when, whenever you would like to fetch these messages, you would have to, def to subscribe to the messages publication. And once the subscription is ready, a callback is going to be invoked, meaning that the local data is ready to use 
And so you can have multiple subscribers uh, subscribing into a single publication. So far, it really sounds like any other route endpoint. But the clear advantage of a subscription publication mechanism over a traditional REST API is that it is based on WebSockets. So using WebSockets, the client and the server can communicate with each other live, uh, and this way ensuring that all the subscribers will always be provided with the most recent data. So whatever happened to the data set of messages, then the publication is going to notify about these changes to all the subscribers and therefore all the clients can readjust their data accordingly uh, until unsubscribing, of course, in which case the data is disposed. <clears throat> Along with subscriptions, which are used to fetch data, you're going to have media methods which are mostly used to run mutations or any kind of operation which requires you to run on a secure environment. Meteor methods should be called twice, once on the client and once on the server whenever you want to run a mutation. And why is that? Well, first it's going to happen on the client because you want to simulate the result as fast as possible. Um, so first you call this method on the client and in the meantime it's going to run the same operation but on the server. And why is that? Because the client is untrusted. You don't know what's going to happen on the client. Maybe it's trying to hack the server. If the result was the same, then the result in the client is going to be the same as well. And if it was, uh, for some reason, different in the server, then the client is going to readjust his uh, data. Now, you call this method twice. It doesn't mean that you actually write the same method twice. You actually write it once in a single module. And thanks to Meteor's awesome bundling system, it will be loaded automatically on both client and server, meaning that you have zero co code duplications. Meteor uses MongoDB as its database layer. I believe why they use MongoDB over any other traditional, sorry, o over any other database is because it uses um, a JavaScript shell, meaning that this way you can use uh, a single language to write for the client, the server, and the database. So the, the database is accessible from the client as well, as I mentioned, under certain restrictions. And thanks to a package Meteor wrote called Minimongo, it also shares the same API in the client. So this API is similar to the official Mongo driver where you can use on the server. Um, but, 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 but the clear advantage is that you don't even have to wait for callbacks. It's going to feel synchronous. It's not really synchronous. I will soon dive into it. But um, you can use direct assignments into variables. So also Media uses something called latency compensation to compensate over differences in data. And this is something similar to what I told you about methods. Only uh, I want to point out here that it also applies to uh, Minimongo collection instances. So for example, if you would like to implement a Facebook application using the Meteor platform, uh, you should have posts, and each post can be like. So assume that you have a likes collection. So whenever you like a post, then a flag is going to turn true in that collection. So first you like the post, and then uh, a like is going to appear under the post. And using the uh, latency compensation methodology, then it's going to happen only locally to simulate the results as fast as possible. And in the meantime, it's going to happen on the server as well because maybe the, the client doesn't ha even have uh, permissions to do so. So the server is going to run the real operation against the data data database and validate it. And if the result was the same, then the UI is going to remain as is. However, if it was different, then the like button is going to revert itself and be grayed out again. So if you are familiar with the MongoDB uh, database, you will know that it's a NoSQL database, meaning that instead of using tables, you actually use instances of collections. Now, I really want to point out something about the MiniMongo API. So if you will look at the code snippet above, um, then it's exactly the same on the client and the server, but it behaves differently. Because if you would run this code snippet on the client, then this collection would actually be a reference to an array, to a local cache, meaning that whatever Mongo operation that you run, find, find one, remove, insert, it's going to run, but against this array. And if this code snippet uh, would, be, um, would be used in the server, then this collection is going to be a reference for a real collection, meaning that whatever operation you run, for example, find, find one, remove, insert, again, 
then it's going to actually happen on a real collection. But then again, thanks to Meteor's awesome bundling system, you only have to write it once, and practically you don't even treat it any differently, because the API is similar, right? So I would like to talk about a Meteor's application server. So the server uses the Node.js platform, and it also uses the DDP client to communicate, uh, to connect between the backend and the frontend of a Meteor application. DDP stands for Distributed Data Protocol, and it, it actually invented by the Meteor team themselves, and it, it is based on WebSockets, meaning that the client and the server can communicate with each other live. The server uses the Connect library to handle certain HTTP requests. It also uses the official Mongo driver to communicate with the database, and the server provides you with a feature called Live Query, meaning that once the client runs a query against the database, and there was a change in the result of the query, then the server is going to stream these results, uh, these changes, sorry, and therefore you can readjust your data accordingly. The server also uses fibers to handle asynchronous tasks. Now, a very good example, and the most simple one, I believe, is presented in a code snippet uh, below the instructions. And if you, you'll take a look at line two, you'll see the sleep method. Now, the implementation of a sleep method is pretty straightforward when it comes to JavaScript. You simply call a method called setTimeout with a thousand milliseconds, and you also invoke it with a callback. And inside this callback, you have the rest of the execution. So how come when you look at the code snippet over here, you'll see that it actually continues the execution of the script, but on the same intention? Well, this is because we use fibers here. The sleep method is actually wrapped with fibers, and fibers are a binary package, uh, meaning that they have the power using the V8 engine to control the event loop and also pause it. So you can say that once you reach uh, line two, it pauses the event loop for a second, and only then it continues. So fibers are uh, similar to, Java, to the new async functions of JavaScript, meaning that inside these functions, you can wait for promises to resolve themselves, and only after you can continue the execution of the script, but in the same indention. So why media uses fibers and not async functions? Well, I believe because back in the days, the concept of async functions did not even exist. Therefore, they had to go for a binary package instead. But I believe that with time, they would mi migrate completely into async functions. Now, what are fibers even good for? Even good for? I, uh, on purpose, I, I really uh, uh, give a very deep explanation about fibers because I think this is a very important concept because Meteor uses fibers all over. Okay, so fibers are good to prevent race conditions, especially for the inexperienced developer, where uh, it's hard for him to detect such a problem and especially fix it. Not even for the inexperienced developer, actually, for anyone, it's very hard to detect. So if there are multiple incoming requests at the same time, what Smeter is going to do is going to put them into some sort of an execution queue and execute one request at a time. So if in the handler there's some sort of an asynchronous tasks, uh, then using fibers, basically Meteor pauses the event loop and therefore it will continue only once this async, uh, async task has finished. Uh, and this way it could, it can uh, uh, pro process all the requests, but in series instead of parallel. So you can uh, use some sort of an unblocking module uh, model instead of uh, a serious one. Uh, but still, I think it's, it's a pretty good thing that by default, Meteor uses fibers and not the other way around. So I talked about the client, about the server, sorry. I think uh, talking about the client is a closure. So Meteor provide, uh, provided you with a few packages which would make your life a bit easier when it comes to client development. So Meteor provided you with the uh, DDP client, which is basically the client which connects to the DDP protocol and enables the connection to a Meteor backend. Meteor also uh, provides you with the package called Minimongo, which already told you it also enables the uh, MongoDB API, but in the client as well. And Meteor provides you with a, an awesome package called Tracker, which basically gives you reactive programming abilities. 
Uh, in the next slideshow, I'm going to explain exactly what reactivity means. But for now, uh, just know that it provides you with the ability to define reactive function scopes. And by default, Meteor comes with a layer view called Blaze, which uses reactive programming to update the UI whenever there was a change in data. So Blaze can easily be replaced with whatever you want, for example, Angular 2, React, or Vue.js by simply installing a few packages. But Blaze comes right out of the box, and it's a pretty, a pretty decent layer view. So as I promised, I'm going to talk about reactivity. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with Makefile. You don't even have to be familiar with it. But it really, if, if you would be familiar with it, you'd know that the concept of reactivity actually exists on a Makefile because you have two sorts of uh, assignments. Actually, more, but I'm going to focus only on two. There's a mediate assignment for a variable, which is the same one as JavaScript. And there's a lazy assignment, which is basically a recursive assignment, meaning that two variables could be de dependent on each other. So if one updates, then the other will update as well automatically without you even doing anything. So here I have a, an awesome code snippet which describes it using a make file. And here I use lazy setting. So we have two variables, A and B, and eventually we would like to have a situation where we have the result, hello world assigned into B. So first we initialize A with world, then we initialize B with A plus world. And once we print B to the console, obviously it would print world world. But watch carefully what happens right now. Once, once I reset A into hello and I print B to the console, it's going to bring hello world, which is pretty interesting But because when you use JavaScript, you would have to do it over again manually. So if instead of using lazy setting, I would have used uh, uh, immediate setting, which uh, instead of using a single e uh, equal sign, I would also prepend a semicolon sign, uh, it would actually behave like JavaScript. So the initialization is the same. There's uh, A equals world, B equals A plus world, and therefore B is world plus world world. And once I reset A to hello, then B is going to remain world world. But now if I reset B manually to be again A plus world, finally it's going to print to the console, hello world. So how can I uh, actually use the same effect as I presented over here in the, in the uh, first slideshow of the make file, but only apply it on, on JavaScript? So with Meteor, you can. I would like now to, go to show you a practical uh, example from a, a real Meteor application, and I would explain that to you, how it works. So here's the concrete example. It begins by subscribing into a publication called Messages. And once this subscription is ready to use and we have the data, then we're going to print the, to the console that the subscription is ready. And now, uh, thanks to the tracker package, we're going to define a reactive function scope. Inside this scope, um, uh, first, the function is going to invoke itself immediately in a synchronous way. So it invo invokes itself the first time, and then we're going to uh, use an instance of a Minimongo collection to find the most recent message. And indeed, this is the same API as the ofi official Mongo driver. And once we fetch the most recent message, we're simply going to print it to the console. Whenever there was a change in the result of the query, um, thanks to live query, we can stream these changes. And so the publication is going to notify these changes to all the subscribers, uh, making this reactive function scope reinvoke itself over and over again whenever there was a change in the result of the query. So again, uh, there was a change in the, in the result of the most recent message, and therefore we're going to print it to the console over and over again. Um, and you can also stop the reactive function scope manually if you have a reference for that function. So Meteor comes with two package managers. It comes with Atmosphere, uh, which is a dedicated package manager, and it comes with NPM. I'm not going to talk about NPM because I, I assume that you're already familiar with it because it's so popular. Um, so about Atmosphere, yeah, it's a dedicated package manager uh, invented by uh, the Meteor team themselves. And at the beginning, they used Atmosphere solely without even touching NPM. But with time, NPM became, became bigger. There were much more packages. The community grew bigger. The ecosystem became much greater. And so Meteor realized that they lose a big potential of the community. And therefore, they started slowly migrating into uh, NPM from Atmosphere, although uh, one day they would like to do it uh, to migrate completely and get rid of, of atmosphere as far as I know. 
With that said, Atmosphere is still pretty useful when you want to be provided with full robust solutions. So for example, if you would like to have an authentication system, the only thing you would have to do would be, without even defining anything, simply installing a few packages, you would have to install the accounts base package using the command uh, below. Uh, so accounts base basically defines all the right publications, all the right uh, minimum go collections and all the right methods. So you can, uh, you can work with an authentication system. And also Accounts UI is basically a package which provides you with few uh, Blaze template helpers if you would like to define uh, register button, login, login using Facebook, login using Twitter, etc. So about Meteor's uh, build system. So I told you, it uses uh, right out of the box, it uses the latest JavaScript syntax of ES6 uh, thanks to the Babel compiler. And once you compile your project using their build system, then it's going to build the project. And there, and afterwards, whatever change you make to that um, to that project, then the, the application is going to refresh by itself. And therefore, you're going to have these features available to you. Now, if the application uh, refreshed by itself, it means that somehow Meteor rebuilt the script. So the most naive solution and most simple one would be actually rebuilding the entire thing. But sometimes it might take quite a time because the application might get bigger. So Meteor is basically very economical because it has a caching compiler, meaning that it stores the most recent result of your most recent uh, build process. And therefore it knows to detect exactly what changes you made and rebuild exactly what it needs uh, without rebuilding unnecessary stuff. Made, making the uh, development experience much, much faster. Also, when you use uh, Meteor's build system, you don't even have to define entry points. Uh, and the entry points would be defined automatically by Meteor based on their location. So all the files which are located under the client directory are going to be loaded on the client only. All the files which are located under the server only are going to be loaded uh, on the server. And files which are defined in neither of these are going to be loaded on both. Uh, right now, the best practice would be defining the files under the imports directory, in which case you import these files manually. So it uses the Babel compiler to compile to ES6. But in case you want to write an Angular application or a React application, you can easily replace it with TypeScript and or JSX or CoffeeScript, etc. by simply installing a few Atmosphere packages. Yeah, so I went through everything I want related to uh, the fundamentals of Meteor's API. Uh, so I would like to have an overview. So here I have a, a diagram which describes the flow where the, the data starts in the database and ends up in the user interface. So first, it starts in the MongoDB database. And once you ran a query against the database, thanks to Meteor's live query feature, you can uh, detect these changes. And the publications are going to stream all these changes into the subscribers and the client subscribers can use these changes to readjust their minimum Go collections accordingly. And thanks to reactive programming, then the user interface is going to update itself automatically. And the flow repeats itself on and on and on and on whenever there was a change in that query until unsubscribing, of course, in which case you basically cut the connection uh, between the client in the right and the server in the left. So I think the best way to prove something and show it would be actually demonstrating it. So that's exactly what I'm going to do right now. So uh, I have an application in the background. Wait, let me uh, make it bigger so you can see. Uh, it's a simple to do app implemented using Meteor and React. I'm going to run it in the background. OK. And in the meantime, I would like to so show you something else with a uh, open, open source project called RocketChat. So this is an open source project which uses the uh, Meteor platform to basically uh, create a Slack loan. So that's exa exactly what it is. Right now we are in a, ch in a channel called general. Inside this channel we have general people saying general stuff basically. And I would like to show you how the UI interacts nicely with Meteor's API without us even doing anything. So uh, let me open the development console. Right now I see, I don't think we have connection, but still I, I would manage to prove my point 
uh, if I do it correctly. And I don't have battery, so hopefully I'm going to survive it. Anyways, um, what I would like to do now would be sending a message without even touching the message box. So I'm going to call a method called send message. And it receives a single argument. And how exactly do I know what method to call and with what arguments? So just as a reminder, this is an open source project. So simply before I gave this talk, I uh, looked at the project and I came prepared. So the first property of this JSON is going to be uh, the message that we would like to send. Let's say hello to everyone. Hello. And it also receives the room ID, in which case it's going to be general. And I watch, careful, watch carefully what happens. Before I press the return button, I want you to notice the UI and how it updates nicely accordingly. And there you go. I, I sent a message now. And what happened is that first it ran on the local cache to simulate the result as fast as possible. And then it's going to happen by the second time on the server. And yeah, as a proof that it actually happened and the connection worked is that the rocket chat bot actually answered me saying hello ethan wait let me uh, make it bigger yeah that's awesome um i'd like to show you another thing using the mini mongo api and let's say i would like to take over the chat uh i i say it as a joke right because i i, I can't really do so uh and change all the messages to be to uh, whatever i want and I don't have permissions to do so, so it's only going to run on the local cache. But still, it's a nice way to show you the power of the Minimongo API. So, um, Rocket Chat luckily exposes their uh, collection instances. And this time I'm going to uh, get my hands on the message collection. And I'm going to use the update method to update all the documents to whatever I want. The query doesn't matter, and I'm going to set the message property to my name, Ethan, that is. And also, I would like to specify to update multiple documents. So, multi-true. And hopefully, it's going to work because whenever I demonstrate it live, it always screws up. Uh, in case I screw up, I'm going to edit it anyways. Oh, it actually worked. And as you can see, all the messages have been updated to be Ethan which is uh, pretty nice, uh, all this stuff, because right out of the box you can start using it, and if you would try to implement such a mechanism yourself, you would see how complicated that is and how much time it, consu it consumes. To so thanks to Meteor, we can just do it, you know, without even thinking. Back to the application which I ran in the background, which runs on port 3000. I'm going to copy it and open it in a new window. And let me... Uh, exit the development tools, put it in the left, and open it in an incognito window so we can log in using two different users. It's a simple to-do app. Uh, so I would like to show you how one user interacts with the other. So to create new tasks, new to-dos, I would have to create a new account. Uh, quickly, I would do that. doesn't matter the details. Yeah, so I have an account now, so I would like you to watch carefully how once I add a new to-do in the account on the left, it's also going to update the account in the right. So uh, I'm going to add a simple to-do and watch carefully how it updates in the right as well. Boom. So uh, the fact that it happened on the left is pretty obvious because it, it can happen locally and there's nothing special about it. But it's, it's interesting that it also happened on the right. Uh, and it was pretty fast, uh, you have to admit. Um, as I told you, whenever whenever there, there's a change uh, in, a, in a data set of a, of a subscription, then uh, the, all the clients are going to be notified about it. So these two clients are uh, subscribers of the uh, um, to-dos publication, and therefore whatever uh, change happens, then uh, they're going to be notified about it. And that's exactly what happened here, because the client in the right uh, used the uh, subscription to update the UI as well. Uh, so again, everything is automatic, very fast, thanks to Meteor. Um, so back to the slideshow. I would like to continue my talk. Okay. So 
I really hope you liked it, the uh, demo. So for those who are familiar with Meteor, as I promised, I'm going to talk about the changelog, the, the two recent versions, which are Meteor 1.4 and 1.5. Um, let's begin with Meteor 1.4, right? So Meteor 1.4, which is the current version, uh, when they released first it, um, they upgraded the Node.js version to be based on version 4. Now, the key thing here is not that they updated the version of Node to be version 4, but rather ensuring that all binary packages work well on all supported platforms by Meteor. So, in case you're using a, an application which is based on a Meteor platform which is older than version 1.4, and you would like to upgrade to Meteor 1.4, I recommend you to rebuild all your bar binary packages, otherwise expect the unexpected. Also, they upgraded the version of MongoDB from version 2.6 to version 3.2. From lots of help from the community, uh, and after MongoDB has proven itself to be stable on version 3.2, Meteor has finally did it, and now also it uses the Wire Tiger engine, which is much, much, much faster than the previous one. One of the main things that happened since Meteor 1.4 is that Meteor doesn't use core packages with pinned versions anymore. So for example, when they released Meteor 1.2, it came with a set of core packages, which were also pinned version 1.2. So this is a nice thing to have, because this way, when you look at a single core package, you can track the, through the current release of Meteor way more easily. But when you think about it, it prevents Meteor from moving towards their vision of upgrading, of, uh, sorry, migrating from Atmosphere to NPM completely, because in NPM, um, each module it's, is much more independent. So since Meteor 1.4, that's exactly what they did. The set of core packages, they don't use the same version anymore, meaning that you can replace these uh, modules with whatever you want, maybe a fork of the community, an older version, a newer version, etc. So the upcoming beta version of Meteor, which is Meteor 1.5, uh, what they tried to do there was improving uh, production runtimes by providing you the ability to load uh, modules dynamically. And this feature is called dynamic imports or, or code uh, splitting. You can call it whatever you want. And this is part of a proposal made for the ECMAScript language, which should land around 2018. Um, so using dynamic imports, uh, you can actually uh, make the startup time much, much faster uh, by reducing the size of the initial bundler, bundle of the application. Because you, if you're familiar with a module bundler, you would know that it takes all the necessary modules for your application to work, uh, and it creates a single script out of it, meaning that you fetch the entire thing um, once the ap application starts. But the thing is, is that not all the modules are essential for the application to start, and they can also be fetched dynamically in specific uh, function scopes. So here I have a nice diagram, we, which actually I took from the official Meteor blog website, so it really helps me describe what's going on. So thank you, Meteor. The credit goes for you. In the left, I have a diagram which describes uh, the usage of... Um, any other traditional bundler like Webpack system JS. So if you use Webpack, you would know that if you would like to have such a mechanism, it's pretty complicated because you would have to define multiple entry points. And still, it doesn't guarantee that you won't have uh, multiple modules which are um, being overlapped and loaded twice. So you can have such a mechanism, although it's pretty complicated to use it in, in Webpack because if you are familiar with it, you know that the configuration file can get pretty complex and pretty rapidly. Um, however, if I look at the diagram in the right, which describes Meteor bundling system, it uses zero configuration and simply you import modules wherever you want, whenever you want, and whatever you want, and Meteor will simply take care of it. And also if you have overlapping modules, which are being loaded twice, uh, sorry, it, it, you would sorry. You would never have uh, overlapping overlapping modules which are being loaded twice thanks to Meteor. Also, if you load a single module dynamically in a single scope, the second time you're going to import it dynamically, Meteor is going to use its cache uh, instead of fetching the uh, module over again. So whatever happens, Meteor got you covered. Since this is a very important feature, and this is what the upcoming beta version is all about, 
I would like to demonstrate it as well. So actually I need to charge my computer. So wait a second. Okay, yeah, uh, now we are good to go. Where was I? Okay, so I was about to demonstrate uh, dynamic imports using a sample application. Um, it's a very simple application. It uses React. Uh, let me first open it in a text editor so I can show it to you. And in the meantime, I'm going to start the application in the background. And soon I'm going to get into it. A simple React application, what it does, it renders a simple view uh, to the browser saying, hello, Meteor. Um, but this is not the point. The point is that this application prints to the console how long did it take to the application to start and how long did it take to the application to render. So over here, I have a startup callback which is going to invoke itself once Meteor is ready to use. And also I have a render function, which simply render the, renders the view. You might ask yourself, why is this an async function? Because it can be an ordinary function. There's nothing async in here. Well, you're right. Uh, but very soon I'm going to use dynamic imports, in which case these imports are going to return promises. And I would like uh, to wait for these promises to resolve themselves before I uh, continue the execution of the script. So I prepared everything beforehand, OK? So let's get to the application which I ran in the background. I think it's already opened. Um, let me refresh it. Yeah, thanks to, uh, to Awesome Meteor, right. So let's look at the console. Let me refresh it. Yeah, so I would like you to, uh, now you can take a look how long did it take to the application to start and how long did it take to the application to render, but I would like you to focus on the ratio between the two times rather than the actual times because there's some stuff which happens in the background which I can control, for example, processes uh, and threads and, and so on and whatnot. No, not threads, it's JavaScript, sorry, processes. So it's going to change, it's, it's dynamic. Anyways, if you'll see uh, the startup, uh, it took almost uh, 700 milliseconds and the render time was pretty fast. I would like to make the startup even faster. Uh, I want to say making the startup faster, it means that I'm going to distribute the load differently. So the startup is going to be faster, but the render is going to be slower. Uh, the overall time is going to remain the same, but if you use it to your advantage, it actually going to feel faster. So there are two ways to do so. Um, so the first way would be, instead of importing these modules at the top of the main module, I can move them to be imported inside the render function instead. And instead of loading the React library and the React DOM library, whenever the application starts up, I will be only loading them once I am, up, I am about to render the view where they're exactly necessary. So some people might raise an eyebrow when they see such such syntax inside a, of, a, of a function. Because of the way Meteor works, this is actually legal. But just in case, I'm going to change it into common.js. So instead of import, I'm going to use const. Instead of from, I'm going to use require. And that should do the trick. Let's get back to the application. Let's refresh it. Okay, and if you would look at the ratio between the times, you see that the startup is faster because it used to be um, um, almost 700 milliseconds, if, I, if I'm wrong, and right now it's less than 600 milliseconds, but the render time is much slower. But still, that's exactly what I wanted. I wanted to distribute the load differently. You can say that more than half a, a second is still pretty slow, and I would like to make the startup even faster. So using the second method, which is using dynamic imports actually, I can even make it faster. So not only I'm going to import the scripts over here in the render function, but also I'm going to fetch these scripts in the render function, reducing the size of the initial bundler, bundle of the application, and therefore the application can start up faster. So how do you use dynamic imports? Instead of using require, I'm going to use import. And since it's going to return 
a promise which is async I'm gonna use the await keyword because we are in an async function scope and this should work let's go back to the application and see what happens let me refresh it um okay right we have progress you see the startup if it's even uh, faster than half a millisecond obviously the render time is much much slower but then again it's exactly what I wanted uh, and if you use it correctly to your advantage it's gonna feel overall much much faster uh, and this is the proof because the startup is faster so also as I told you it uses cache so in case in case you you you're importing the same module dynamically twice uh, media is gonna is not gonna fetch it twice like it will take care of you and making sure that uh, it uses cache instead uh, especially in production mode in which case the first time you load the application is gonna fetch the entire thing but the second time you're gonna refresh the application then it's gonna use the cache for all the modules making it super fast for the application to start up so this is uh, Meteor 1.5 on a nutshell uh, everyone I really uh, hoped you liked it and so thank you very much uh, for uh, watching this video. Thank you very much for listening. You can follow me on GitHub if you want. Follow me on Twitter, although I prefer GitHub. I'm going to provide you with all the links in the description. And again, thank you very much.